Greetings. This is uh, Sister Rebecca, a.k.a. Holly Hood, and today I want to report, I want to give an update on some breaking news regarding Donald Sterling. Uh, in a historic announcement, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver has handed Los Angeles Clippers owner Donald Sterling a lifetime ban from the NBA, along with issuing the maximum allowable fine of $2.5 million. Of greater significance, Silver has also instructed NBA owners to oust Sterling as the owner of the team. The announcement sets the table for an epic legal fight over ownership of the Clippers and the powers of the commissioner. Now, Silver has broad authority under the NBA's constitution and bylaws to suspend and fine an owner uh, for conduct detrimental to the NBA. According to Sil Silver, um, Sterling admitted it was his voice on the recording in which he made the racist remarks. Even if the recording was unlawfully created under California law, the recording would likely be unlawful if the conversation was confidential and Sterling didn't give consent. Silver is authorized to punish Sterling based on the recording's impact on the league. Now, remember, they lost uh, millions of dollars in endorsements um, because of this leaked tape. It is safe to say then that Sterling's comments, which elicited the rebuke of President Barack Obama, have deeply harmed the NBA and its relationship with the players, the sponsors, and the fans. Sterling seems to lack a viable argument that his conduct was not seriously detrimental to the NBA. Sterling is also disadvantaged in challenging the suspension and fine because of how a court would treat such a challenge. So a court would review Silver's um, decision under the deferential, arbitrary, and capricious standard of review. This standard would essentially require Sterling prove that the NBA, and specifically Silver, acting as the NBA's ultimate arbiter, failed to follow its own rules and how it investigated Sterling and punished him. For instance, if the NBA failed to authenticate the recording, concealed evidence or not, uh, requested a meeting um, with, Sil with Sterling, Sterling might have sufficient grounds. So in other words, you know, if, if they can't prove that it's him, even though he's, he said it was his, his voice, um, but if they can't authenticate it, then um, they would have to have a meeting with Sterling and he could have um, sufficient grounds. Silver's remarks during the press conference, however, suggests that all relevant rules and policies were indeed followed. Um, wow, this is so interesting. So now they, they've taken action, which is a good thing. You know, it's not a bad thing because action was needed to be taken. I mean, you know, come on already. This guy, he opens his big mouth and I, I'm glad he did because now I know. So if I ever see him, I know that, you know, I personally have nothing to say to him. But, um, you know, it's good to know how people feel before you stick your hand out and want to shake their hand. OK, the woman at the center of the scandal involving um, Donald Sterling said that she is very saddened at the punishment levied to Sterling by the NBA, NBA commissioner, Adam Silver. Her name, V. Stiviano, uh, she said through her attorney, Mike Nahore, Nahore um, that she never wanted to do any harm to Donald. OK, that that is um, actually um, a contradiction in and of itself, because if you didn't want to harm him, then why did you release the tape? So um, that stands to be, you know, to be uh, determined. But as a practical effect, the suspension all but excommunicates Sterling from both his team and the NBA. Good. We don't need you there. He is forbidden from any contact with the players, the coaches, and the staff, and he is barred from attending games or practices. Sterling is also prohibited from participating in league activities. He is now essentially in NBA exile. Good. Good riddance. The fine of $2.5 million may seem inconsequential given that Sterling is worth reportedly $1.9 billion but it was the highest amount of money permitted by the league's constitution and bylaws. Uh, had Silver 
issued a higher fine and justified it on policy or moral grounds, he would have provided Sterling with an opportunity to raise a legal point, which is the fact that that 2.5 is the highest amount allowed. Specifically, Sterling might have argued that such a penalty is arbitrary and capricious because it would not have followed the NBA rules. Uh, Silver, who is an attorney, by the way, wisely adhered to the rules instead. So he did the right thing. Uh, while Silver said he had not polled the owners, he expressed confidence that there would be sufficient support to oust Sterling. Uh, Silver's bold prediction suggests that he has the necessary votes already. Uh, that said, expect there to be some debate among the owners. No owner will defend Sterling's racism, but some might question whether Article 13 and potentially other authorizing language was intended for this type of transgression. Expect, expect some owners to raise these following four concerns, and this, this is very important. The first concern is one, neither the Clippers nor Sterling is in financial trouble. Article 13 was designed as an extraordinary remedy for such a problem. Not other problems, but for that for that problem, the financial problem. While sponsors have dropped their deals with the Clippers and the players, um, have con and the players have contemplated boycotts, the team appears to be in strong financial shape with a deep pocketed, if albeit reviled owner. There is no reason to believe that Sterling has committed financial fraud. And while he has been sued over allegations of race, those cases were either settled or unsuccessful. Point two is the Clippers are not run in a racist way. So Sterling may be extreme, despite Sterling being extremely bigoted, um, and hold reprehensible views, there is no reason to su suspect that the team itself operates in a racist way. The current Clippers workplace appears to be a productive setting devoid of allegations by players or other employees that they have experienced racism. And similarly, there are no reports that the Clippers have directed ticket sales and marketing efforts away from minority fans. So as a franchise, the Clippers appears to be well run, which would make it an unusual candidate for termination. Okay, point three is the lack of morals clause. Article 13 lists a series of enumerated wrongs, some of which are specific, but none of which seem directly relevant to an owner whose racism expressed in a private conversation sparks national outrage. Some owners might argue that if the NBA wanted to ouster as a remedy for the situation like this one, the constitution and bylaws drafters would have included it in the paperwork. Along those lines, there is no morals clause in these documents that empowers the ousting of an NBA owner. The absence of a morals clause, in contrast to the inclusion of other provisions, could suggest that such a clause was intentionally omitted. And point four that the owners may, may raise is that while, while Sterling's actions seem unlikely to be replicated by another owner, some owners could worry that if they agree to oust Sterling, different situations might give rise to the same consequence for other owners. Once one owner is ousted, there is a precedent to do it again. Mark Cuban recently voiced those exact concerns, calling the situation a slippery slope. So, you know, there, there, he does have a, a hope and a prayer, but I don't think he deserves one. I think that if that's how you feel and you're in charge of people that you dislike, then there is the potential for mistreatment and unprofessionalism. I've worked when I was in the workforce, and especially when I was in the entertainment business, I've had to deal with some of the most despicable people. And in some cases, I already knew they didn't like me from the door. And so when you have to do business with people, it's bad enough trying to come to an agreement on the business when they make it personal, that's inappropriate. There's no place in business for personal issues. Okay, so the NBA um, is reacting to Silver's decision on Sterling. A breach of contract claim uh, would contend that Sterling's contract with the NBA through his franchise agreement has been unlawfully severed. So, um, you know, this is um, this is one point that people are bringing up. But the NBA, however, is poised to stress that owners agree to language limiting opportunities for owners to sue the NBA and fellow owners. 
in their franchise agreements, NBA owners agree to waiver of recourse verbiage. The language, and this is what that means, the language has the effect of eliminating opportunities for owners to pursue legal recourse against the NBA and fellow owners. So um, that pretty much sums up his hope and a prayer. Okay, um, this pretty much sums up the video. I wanted to give you an update. Um, Am I sad? No, not at all. You find a billionaire, what is the equivalent of a uh, $20 fine, if it, if in fact that, and um, you know, he's laughing all the way to, to, um, to his next uh, stop, you know, which is probably to the next mist mistress. Uh, the woman in the, um, in the case claims that she was never his mistress, that they didn't have a personal relationship. I doubt that seriously. I mean, she's driving around in a Ferrari that he bought. And I can tell you that, you know, I know women who've slept with men for IHOP. So if she's got a Ferrari, she's, she's more than a friend. Okay. Um, let's, let's wrap it up. I'm going to end in prayer. Father God, I ask you to, um, you know, racism is not something new that we're dealing with. This is something that's been going on for quite some time. But I'm glad that, Father God, the world is beginning to open their eyes to this and see that, you know, this is not, it's not cool. And we have to live together, whether we like it or not, we have to live with each other. So a lot of people are now standing up and saying, you know what, I, I might have thought this or that about another race, but now that I've actually lived with them, I mean, I'm in the hood and there are more white people in my neighborhood moving in every day to the point where it's no longer the hood in terms of being just a black neighborhood. So, you know, we're learning to live together and get along. And as people get to know us, they're saying to themselves, and, and let me reiterate that, you know, I may have felt this way about a certain uh, group of people, but now that I get to uh, interact with them and I'm living around them, I see that, you know, what I was taught growing up and what I've learned over um, time is not the case. There's, there's cool, there's good and bad in everybody. And frankly, when I was growing up, my motto was that um, there were two kinds of people, cool and uncool. So you know, you, you avoid the uncool ones and you, and you hang and you get to know and you make friendships with the cool ones. And um, so that's my prayer is that we learn to, to look at people um, as John F. Kennedy, he said it so eloquently, you know, and, and judge them not based on the color of their skin, but on the character of the content of their character. So I thank God. I thank God that I'm one of those people who's totally devoid of racism. Um, and I hope that more will join me. There's a lot of us out here who uh, feel the same way. We, we just want to live and coexist uh, with each other. And God, help us to be able to do that. I thank you and bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And uh, I thank you guys for watching and always supporting my work. Um, this is God's work. I cannot take the glory and I never will because the glory is not mine. Have a blessed day.